Attention duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Welcome to The Bridge. I'm your host, Kira Young, and you've reached me on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. We're also simulcasting tonight with Real Liberty Media, and we also are simulcasting with Confluence Radio. So welcome, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I have a great guest tonight. Um, We're going to talk shit about the psychopaths in charge for a little bit, and then the second hour we'll have an anarchist roundtable. Um, stick around. You're going to get information and analysis that you won't get in the mainstream media and you won't get it in the Indian media either. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys a, a short commentary about supporting the media that um, you get something from, uh, the, real, the real deal. Uh, there's been a lot of um, people in the alternative media really getting down on people for asking for their um, their work to be supported. And um, I think that's a bunch of crap because we're working hard for you. There's a lot of people that go into doing just this show behind the scenes, not just me. And when you support, if you get something out of this show, if you learn something, um, support it. Uh, so don't be afraid. If you want to support the show and the... Um, the food sovereignty project that me and my family have going on, you can go to PayPal, that evil site known as paypal.com, and my email address is valkyra, V A L K Y R A, 1969 at gmail.com. Um, the, we're in our second year of our goal of obtaining food sovereignty for ourselves, and we're sharing the wealth along the way and the wealth in terms of food that won't kill you (laughs) organic food that won't kill you Um, and we're teaching ourselves so our our first year out in the woods between Winchester Virginia and Martinsburg West Virginia by the creek by Bat Creek Um, it's totally wild so our first year was infrastructure um, putting gardens in that had always been wild digging up rocks and putting in fences and um, and then my husband, Majikia, built a, a hoop house and we were able to actually get salad through the winter in the hoop house. And then this year, we've really concentrated on making healthy pollinator habitat. So and we've been very successful at that. It is just a hummingbird, butterfly, bee, songbird wonderland out there. Um, so we're going to keep it up. And, and then this su- Winter, we're going to keep the hoop house going and um, study up on permaculture and just keep on keeping on with that. So, um, you know, I just wanted to let you guys know about that. So without further ado, I would like to welcome my super awesome guest, 
of MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to the bridge, James Evan Pilato. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. You asked me what we were going to talk about, and I thought, well, <laughs> um, we could just talk shit about the psychopaths in charge because there's so many con games going on right now that we could just pick one and, and start um, making fun of it because it's so obvious once you once you see it, you can't unsee it. So here's a, the first one because I honestly don't know. So it's you know it's Saturday, so I've got errands and doing other things, and my cat might jump on me here at any moment. Um, is what is this the current status with the Dakota Access Pipeline? They've stopped it. They haven't stopped it. Which is wh where do we stand right now? Saturday, September tenth. Yeah, it's pretty confusing, isn't it? Well, there was two decisions that came down. Well, there was one decision, which was the court said F you to the Standing Rock Sioux, who had filed an injunction on Friday, last Friday, saying there's some grave sites over here in this spot exactly right here. And then the next day, Saturday, during my show, they bulldozed right through that site where they said the bones were and destroyed the evidence. And then that's when they took out the dogs and the pepper spray and sicked them on the people. So then this Friday, yesterday, uh, there, the injunction that the Standing Rock Sioux had filed was denied. And, but then there was this, this joint uh, statement that was put out by the Department of the Interior, the Department of the Army, and, um, and I guess the Obama administration. But, and all they said was that we're putting a halt to this. But it's not a halt forever. It's a halt so that we could reconsider things. And a lot of people that are on the ground, they're saying, well, this is just this is a, a small victory because it's putting a halt to this to, you know, the actual construction right now today. But they're just going to reconsider all their past decisions. And once they do that, they'll, they'll just probably screw us again and they'll take the steam out of the movement while they're doing it. So. And they're able to get a little bit of positive PR for the Justice Department. I'm surprised they would actually <laughs> do do something sort of for the people. So actually here I, I, I was able to kind of start. Justice Department overrules court. Did Kokoda access pipeline construction halted September 9th on anti-media? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So people are celebrating, but at the same time they know that this is just because this movement had so much um, juice in it mm -hmm. that they have to do something. And all of the past things that have worked before, turning them into violent thugs, that wasn't working because of alternative media and, and because of um, social media. Quite frankly, they could, not, they could not use their old playbook, which was turn these people into criminals and make people hate and fear them. They just couldn't do it because mm -hmm. too many of those people were on their friends list. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, their Twitter feed. It just, it wasn't working. So they've got to do this other thing. Um, so, but it's been interesting because the last three shows, we really have been taking a, a really uh, close look at it and getting reports from people that are right there in the thick of it. Now, and, I, uh, I, I, I saw someone, I think, I, actually, I think it was Joe Rogan. I saw Joe Rogan tweet yesterday in regards to, this situation you see guys this is why it's so important about north dakota legalizing armed drones and i kind of wow. recall that story Holy and and moly. that's and those are the i mean you know corbin and i have been doing new world next week for a long long time now and we kind of joke when we're doing episodes sometimes and you know divvying up and figuring out exactly what we're going to talk about each week so many times ago didn't didn't we already talk about this? I swear there's a time we already covered this story exactly. Because as the years went by, we talked about drones being armed and the sort of tiptoe as it goes. And mm -hmm. those situations in North Dakota, because I think that was one of the first places they had used drones for cattle rustling. Mm -hmm. Or, or, or anti-cattle rustling, I, I suppose. Poaching. Right. And, and I think it is now legal in North Dakota to 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 arm them with like pepper spray the drones with pepper spray I, I read something but I didn't I didn't get a chance to research whether it was true or not I said this can't possibly be true but um yeah so that is the crazy I mean that's kind of the future 
we've seen laid out for us in all our sci-fi movies. We're going to mm-hmm. be fighting drones, and we're going to be figuring out, oh, a T-shirt. Yeah, that's one of the best ways to knock them out. Oh, well, if you've got a shotgun, yeah, that's even better. Yeah. Yeah, it makes you kind of like that Second Amendment a little bit, <laughs> even though people take it to the extreme. I mentioned this a story on my show the other day about a, a woman in Virginia in no, it wasn't Winchester. You just planted Winchester in my brain because you said that. But uh, somewhere in Virginia, she lawfully blasted a drone on her property. And I feel like yeah. those stories are only going to come more and more. But they'll continue to try to make it seem like it's a cool thing to have a drone, like drones are cool. That will continue to play out in the mainstream. Um, and movies will come out drones will be our best friends in the movies you know yeah i mean because you can only i mean you can just easily project it ahead and put and put yourself in that situation and just like we did with cameras we're gonna go oh well shit if everybody's gonna be filming me i at least better have a camera on me at all times too so i'll i'll just tape everything i do we'll get to the point where we just have our little guardian drones that hover around us and they can protect us and they'll always shoot video or shoot at our our enemies isn't that what it'll be or the Indians will have the armed um, raptors <laughs> that we let loose instead. The the, um, the primitive savages won't have the drones. We'll have the uh, we'll have the animals on our side. Hey, so speaking of savages, how'd you end up in my home state of West Virginia? That's I know one thing when you and I were first kind of of getting in contact with each other. I was like. You're in Martinsburg? I was like, I lived 10 minutes away from Martinsburg for a decade going to it's school. It's a funny story how that happened because I've moved around my whole life. And um, I'll just start with, all right, back in the late 90s, I was living in the Bay Area. I met my husband at a powwow. Um, and one night, I think it was 2002, I got this this voice like in the middle of the night said, go now, your mother needs you. And so I told my husband, and he didn't look at me like I was insane, and he said, let's start packing. And so we, we packed up and we moved to central Pennsylvania, which is where my mom was mm. um, started, had started an organic berry farm. And I thought she just needed my help with the farm, but she was in much greater need when we arrived. Um, she was suicidal. So um, there was that. <laughs> and then um, there was no work in central Pennsylvania, so... Um, we went down to the DC area where we could find work and then we ended up coming out to this area because DC was so expensive and yeah. And I found a job where I can pretend to be a secretary and we can try to build this alternative reality. Well, and I love, I love to think, and I've been in Oregon now for over a decade and I don't know that Cassie and I have ever really said that we're here forever. You know, as you start to get older and be and kind of just as you're saying, being further away from family gets harder, mm-hmm. gets harder and harder as the as the time goes by. And Portland is now starting to feel pretty squishy and over. It feels like the place everybody moved to in the last couple of years, and that everybody's continuing to move to. So it's just kind of getting overstuffed and all kinds of people, and they're bringing all their cars and all their stuff. And like anything, I always make music analogies, it's kind of like anything. Once something kind of gets overrun and overtaken, the balance is going to get shifted, and it's going to be more people who aren't sort of the conscientious. In the the beginning, you'll start to kind of lose all of the things that made it nice in the first place. It's just tough living through a city during its, I guess... It's transition, it's growth Mm -hmm. spurt. Because it's sort of like, if I wanted to live in a city where I was stuffed with people and didn't want to give a shit about them, I could have moved to Manhattan a long time ago. My (laughs) brother lived there, you know, I've spent lots of time there. But my dream, I think, in a lot of ways is that West Virginia could become, you know, it would be so easy for... West Virginia to flip and kind of become the most freedom oriented state on the entire East Coast to give, you know, New Hampshire run for its money. If West Virginia just started 
growing cannabis. I know it sounds like yeah. a pipe dream, but imagine all the things and all the problems. And I talk about this in my work a lot because I, you know, I have to look look away three thousand miles to see my home state kind of some way we kind of willingly beating itself to death. It's like replace your coal industry, which is already screwed and done, and you don't make any of the money off of it anyway. It all goes out of state. Just grow yep. cannabis. Just grow cannabis, and you'll sell it, and you'll be an empire, and then all that stuff you can also use as your medicine because you guys all got hooked on opioids from Big Pharma, and then you moved on to worse stuff. That's why there's more overdoses in West Virginia than anywhere in America right now. Did you see that story yeah. about like sort of the spread yes. of, you know, so many overdoses in Huntington and then so many overdoses in Clea kind of spread around the mid Ohio Valley of just this deadly, crappy heroin scourge. And and every place where um, they do legalize cannabis for medical use, opioid deaths go down by 40 percent or more. Mm -hmm. Isn't that funny how that happens? Mm -hmm. Even if it was just hemp. Just industrial hemp yeah. alone would change everything, absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. And that's what we hope will happen because we're going to fill every square inch of our six acres with it if, once they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And well, back in the, in the 90s when I used to travel around, I was going to college in New England. I used to travel around um, the different colleges and educate people about um, – uh, the marijuana conspiracy and cannabis and hemp and all that. And um, it was actually my idea to put a table at Lollapalooza. I had gone to Lollapalooza and I was like, hey, we need a table here. And then the next year they, there were tables at all of them. Um, I didn't get to go, <laughs> but the tables did. <laughs> but uh, so then we, uh, I said then, it was like 1990, I don't know, two or three. I said it, eventually it will become the only viable economic option. Because we could already see the signs of how mm -hmm. the psychopaths in charge were just pumping the economy dry and, and evaporating the middle class. It started then. And when you know, they learned their lesson with uh, Vietnam in terms of, of uh, you know, drafting people to fight, they said, no, no, we just got to train them to want to. And then, the, and then we'll, we'll make most of the jobs, contractor jobs that pay over 100000 <laughs> a year like generator mechanics for and yeah electricians for, for their and, private buddies yeah and it'll there'll be no bid contracts and everybody will get rich off of killing people won't that be fun and where did all and those, they've been doing it ever since and all those jobs all disappeared thanks to the amazing people who have d's after their names not like those evil people who have r's after their names <laughs> yeah, they're they're on the same team. I, I learned that <laughs> recently <laughs> after the Obama con game. I uh, fell for it the first time. I, and then I woke up. It's just you know, it's so ridiculous. You know, if if we spend any too long, like if I look at it for too long, any one time, like it's just like, are you guys serious? I can't believe you're falling for this. I can't believe you're so invested in this. Yep. Yep. And then I al I also called it. I said, next it'll be, we have to, you know, it'll be the, the first woman president con game. Whereas last time it was the first black president con game. And I, and I said, this time I'm not going to fall for it because I mean, well, you look at it, it's not really a choice. Let's see a sociopath or a narcopath. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. That's awesome. Which do I choose? So what do you what do you think what do you see happening in the next whatever I you know now I now I think it's getting down to the point where I th I saw some day about now. Like we might be down to 100 days or maybe even less September October. Yeah, it's less than that. Yeah, it's it's Hillary's turn. So she'll get in no matter what happens, you know, no matter what any of us do or vote for mm -hmm. or whatever. It'll be her. It's her turn. She's paid her dues. And I think just like, and, and, and again, this is why it's so frustrating. It's like you guys you fall for this year after year after year. You have people, you know, old friends and family who are even older than you in some cases. It's like, how do you still fall for this year after year after year? Oh, I know it's because you only pay attention every four or eight years. And then mm. the rest of the time they're not paying attention. They're invested in it right now. I can make the analogy. It would be like if I... I hate sports. 
if I showed up <laughs> every four years or whatever and was like, let me tell you all about the World Cup because I'm going to tell you what teams, <laughs> and I know all about it. And people would go, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. You don't pay attention to it at all. You're a fair weather fan and you're going to show up here and get all invested in it and paint your face up and act like it. But at the end of the day, I know you don't pay attention. And that's what's frustrating with the sort of, you know, your, your friends and your family that you know. It's like this is nothing more than Coke or Pepsi or who you thought should have won on The Bachelor. Because I know oh. you the rest of those other three to seven years when you're not paying attention at all. And does it really? Oh, I have to remind you that we're not supposed to do F-bombs. Because oh, okay. Of the Sorry. FCC. <laughs> Sorry about that. I usually tell people and I forget, but... Um, yeah, so, and does it really even make a difference who who's in there anyway? Because they're not really the ones in charge anyway. Let, so, Obama, he could really be totally sincere about what he, you know, that that could be a possibility. And then they just look like, we're, we're going to kill your whole family. So you better do this instead. Cause so, I mean, it, does president really matter? No, I, mean, I think it seems yeah. like with each, and, and because they need, so ultimately it doesn't, it doesn't matter because they're, as we can see, the agenda rolls on and it doesn't really change. And they'll all have the same advisors. So you could look and go, oh, that's hilarious. Hillary has the same advisors as Bush and lots of Homeland Security people. Oh, it's all the same neocon gangsters. Mm -hmm. No matter who the, the chosen one is, that go round, it is interesting to watch all the stops being pulled out. Sometimes the timing is right. And you pretty much cruise to victory with a Madison Avenue, you know, emotional campaign like Obama. And everybody was just for it, and they all voted for him, and everybody whoopee, skippily do. Mm -hmm. But the previous one, you saw Bush the whole way. So what was it? It was early in the primaries or something, and I forget. Some early state where generally, as the horse race of it goes, hey, whoever wins this early state X, some of the attention and money is going to start to flow that way. Money wants to go to you know, a winner. It doesn't care. It just, again, wants those buddy contracts later on down the road. So Bush loses some early primary thing, and for some reason, against all political history, the, the money and the attention still goes to him, even though it should have uh -huh. gone to McCain, who won it, historically speaking. All, and each step of the way, all the things that were popping up that were going to prohibit Bush from winning were all plucked out of the way. So whether that's the motorcade is going to go down Elm Street one way or the other, and the teams are there and all set, and nothing is going to stop that from happening. So no, now with Hillary, they've got a good ringer with Donald Trump, who is meant to take the fall this time, just like right. Bob Dole took the fall, just like Mitt Romney took the fall, just like Dukakis, just like all the others do, all these others who sort of give it a good run, and then just sort of, oh, man, it looked like he kind of stumbled and fell. Like, oh, it was like it was a fixed race or something. <laughs> so what is going to continue to be pulled out of the way for Hillary to get in? As, which is, as you said, which is totally obvious. I wish I could go back to my old shows from, from 08 and where I said, oh, yeah, obviously they had that meeting on the plane and probably told Hillary chill out we're gonna give it to barry this time we've got a sweet mm -hmm. gig in the cabinet you'll make a ton of money doing other stuff and then you yeah. know in eight years we'll probably bring you back around the bilderbergs have decided remember when they stuck away snuck away and, and locked the press corps on the plane mm -hmm. they snuck away and yep. did the bilderberg meeting in in chantilly virginia so what things now with hillary are going to be moved out of the way and chick and fixed and changed things that we never could have really because we didn't have Facebook and Google and these the overlay that is able to manipulate it. They might not have to pull any of the levers in the phony rigged machines because like Sun Tzu was like, oh, the battle was already over before you guys even started fighting. Right. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I've always thought since, since Trump became uh, a candidate that it was like, he's so abhorrent, like he's so hateable that she's the only choice left, even though she's hateable too. But she's not as scary hateable 
<laughs> it's him, I guess. Well, or is it? And yeah, then, it's sort of that. It's her her legions aren't as scary on the face of them as Trump's, as I think right. what some of it comes down right. to too. Hashtag yeah. basket of deplorables. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and and because he's more of a narcissist and she's more of a cool psychopath. <laughs> um, he's more like hateable because he has that narcissistic rage where he can't control himself when people Mm -hmm. talk shit about him Mm -hmm. they get he gets really upset whereas she's like she doesn't care you know she's like i could have you murdered in two seconds like what do i care what you say about me so now that's like she doesn't have that narcissistic injury she's just a cool calm psychopath the the more so. Ted the more Ted Bundy st- although I guess that's uh, that's a whole other conversation um <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um but that you actually just said it there's part of me that still thinks and wonders that Trump getting whacked in the next several weeks would be the most it would be the complete so we've had a couple of years of you know all the all these minorities getting mad and rioting and doing all that stuff and the complete flip back on that would be if Trump got whacked and it would be the complete rise of the super hater so called alt right it would be all that element would sort of it would be the blank check for them to go riot basically i've just kind of been looking mm. at at the purge films especially the one that just came out called election year as a little bit of a, a of a correlation and somewhat you know that synchromysticism or just straight up predictive programming it's a movie mm-hmm. where a woman running for president is the good person and is going to do away with the purge the yearly thing where all laws are suspended and people have slowly realized through the course of the three films that it's actually about population control and it's when the rich people go kill all the lower classes on the purge but the new founding fathers, a very sort of new right, think that the purge is great and want to keep it going. And it's this very populist uprising and that they want to, they don't say it out, but they want to keep America great. Mm-hmm. It's a thinly veiled caricature of the sort of Trump and Hillary tropes in some way. But it's basically all about people going nuts and killing each other in the streets. Wow. Helter Skelter yeah. style. Nice. Nice. <laughs> nice stuff. Yeah. And, and well, I mean, Trump really does uh, make Hillary look better because she's not an, an overt racist, you know, a-hole out there, like, whipping up the crowds to punch people and just being really crass. And, you know, she's she plays the game and pretends to be a decent person, you know, better than he does. Um, so then what just, about the health thing? Yeah, that's that's going to I mean, people are just going to be like, oh, that's just a bunch of tinfoil hat stuff. And they'll they'll just poo poo it until she wins at the White House. But you know, what just, if it'll just be poo pooed? But what if it is actually a problem on mm-hmm. their hands that they're suddenly going we've groomed this whole thing for decades. The time is right. And she's going to friggin' croak on us. <laughs> well, I guess we don't know who's, who's going to be the, the vice. I guess that'll, um, well, that's, that's as of now it's Tim Kane. Mm-hmm. Now there was even actually just a story the other day of a, a former, a former Virginia governors at McConnell was just yes. cleared of all corruption charges. Mm-hmm. I was like, yeah. man, Hill Dog and Timmy are getting things done, and you can they just are. see you can see the handshakes happening again before the big show happens. All the moves are made and all the deals are made, and you can see it in just like who gets promoted, who's moving, who's getting squashed. All the media that's moving around right now is is mm-hmm. I think also sort of in some ways in preparation for the next you know so-called regime right yeah and and the changes are they are window dressing they really are they're not none of the changes are fundamental so um you know it's always let's dangle this carrot and the carrot being the rights that you should already have because you're existing 
mm-hmm. that we're going to that we took from you because we're psychopaths and we're going to give it back to you so that you think you're getting something while we you know keep your attention on you getting this right back that you should already have we're going to you know behind the scenes we're going to pass like we'll give you gay marriage and we'll pass TTP or whatever you know that's uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> that's what happens the whole way through so I've got you know, I know when, clips back on the old shows too where I was like Obama uh, He'll give us weed, but everything else will probably be taken away. (laughs) Everything else. (laughs) So all you'll have is weed. And and that's, you know, and that's something people in the alt media say, oh, you dumb stoners, you're falling for it. You're falling for this, you know, marijuana. They want you all dumb and docile on Monsanto weed. It's like, man, I don't think it's that simple. That's the simple power of cannabis is that it's not that easy to control. And now that the toothpaste is getting out of the tube, yeah, of course, Monsanto, they're going to start working on all of that stuff. Yeah. But I believe, it's my hope, that the people who have been stewards of cannabis and hemp for centuries aren't going to go like the people who are holding some tomatoes and are like, yeah, whatever, we'll sell it to Monsanto. Am I being too hopeful that, that marijuana won't go the way of all the other GM foods? Oh no, it won't. No, there's no. There will always be. I mean, because look how how ma- how long the that community has had to keep things secret. There will always be a vault of seeds that are untouched by Monsanto f- forever, plus eternity. You know, um, no matter how hard Monsanto pushes to GMO the world, and that goes with food too. There will always be a vault of seeds that are pure. Um, because people are working on it. Lots of people that don't even know each other <laughs> are working on that because we it's really obvious that that has to be done. So isn't it funny that we go through everything only to work our way back around to the simplest, most sort of earthy ways of doing things that we all now have this epiphany that maybe natural foods and way of life and simple living and not taking part maybe this is the way to go that we had to go through all the horrible things to come back and reach that sort of simple fundamental conclusion that again our grandparents and and previous generations all knew yeah and and really to, we have a new appreciation for it that's for sure i mean i work my butt off just trying to grow food and learn more about what I can forage. Um, I've upped my foraging skills like quite a bit over the last mm. year. And my, my, my big hashtag now is eat weeds because they're free <laughs> <laughs> and they grow everywhere. And they're, they have all the nutrients that's lacking in our highly processed uh, food chain. So that's why Roundup, that's why Monsanto wants to kill them too, because you know, it's, it's, it's everything that you need. So stop eating, start growing your own food, start growing what wants to grow where you live. That, that's the hugest revelation that I had this year was Mm. I I would go, I started going out picking weeds to eat and I, and i looked around me and I was like, there's more weeds here that I could ever possibly eat. Like this is the physical experience of the abundance of the earth and how there's enough for us provided daily (laughs) as you know as the years have gone by we've we've now been using a there's a service that's sort of like a csa here in in oregon and in the in the you know portland metro area basically it's called organics to you and it's a home delivery of local in-season organic produce and what's so fun about it is what comes in is what is in season, is what is being harvested. So we've been learning as the years go by of what's, you know, what's in season, what's coming out. Oh, beets are apparently always in season here in Oregon. They always get those. <laughs> have to always figure out what to do with them. And it's that, Have you, know, you ever done beet greens? A little bit, because we also, you know, we got we also have a, a juicer and start and and are making broth and trying to do a lot more in our just little tiny kitchen. We're almost at the point where we need a surplus, you know, fridge just to have some extra storage space. Yeah, yeah, beet greens like just sautéed or are really really mm-hmm. good. Um, 
Actually, anything sautéed in butter is good. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I was like, ah, oh, with some butter and garlic, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> anything. That's the same with the weeds. That's what I do with all the weeds. I just fry them up in some grass-fed butter, and I'm good to go. So... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's why they call marijuana weed because it grows so well and it grows everywhere. Yeah. And it's, it is uncontrollable like weeds. So you I, you know, I think if, if it's a, if the marijuana conspiracy gets a bunch of people out of prison and doesn't ruin people's lives for using a plant and starts to roll away all of that. You know, I love seeing the stories here in Oregon of former weed dogs now pretty much out of work. They're going to go do something else. They used to work for the Oregon police, but now it's like, oh, that's awesome. That dog now gets to go sort of do something else. He gets another sort of lease on life, if you will. Leash on yeah. Life. yeah. So what do you think, I mean, since obviously... Um you know, cannabis should totally be legal. What do you think of, do you think all drugs should be legal and it should be more of a, um, a health issue than like a, a criminal justice issue? Like pretty much. Public... Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think again, just as you said, whatever sovereign consenting adult humans want to put in up on them is their business. The only mm-hmm. problem in puritanical America they can never flip that switch overnight because right. there's been so many generations of lies and propaganda that people probably would go nutso and do all come and, and again maybe hell maybe that's like maybe that's a good thing maybe the people who would go nuts and kill themselves on drugs well maybe that's that's a great thing we may have had all that happen now it's just it's you're either sort of for freedom or not for it yeah yeah and sometimes it's yeah. ugly and 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 painful, but that's what the fundamental battle is. That's why Huxley could tap into that. I think people are going crazy and drinking and and drugging themselves to death. I mean, they they're already doing that. It's that's the, true. The legality of it really doesn't factor into people's decision making. I don't think when they decide to do something, it's. That's because they want to do it. There not- is, you know, in some ways, there is. A, I, I was, <laughs> I've, I was out drinking with a friend a couple Fridays ago, and I think we were outside. I think he was smoking a cigarette, and I was just smoking a one hitter, and just sort of thinking of like, you know, at the same moment, it feels like. Go ahead, go ahead. And that we know. The police state is here. It's not coming. The the sort of the overlay is all there. That at just the same moment it feels like the total lockdown is coming. At the same moment it almost feels like you can kind of do whatever you want in in a little bit of ways. Most police stations. That's this again. This is that weird, you know, double side. They're all being militarized, but they're also totally have more than they can ever do, and are and are poorly funded. And lots of cities have started to. You know, Portland decriminalized a lot of things a long time ago. There's this huge list of, it's like, oh, if you call the cops for that, yeah, we probably totally won't come because we don't have time for any of that petty junk anymore. So there's a little (laughs) bit of a feeling of, like, standing out on the sidewalk and being like, it sure kind of feels like I can do what I want. Just, you know, that's always that phony religious, oh, well, if there weren't, you know, laws or or Ten Commandments or all those things, oh, yeah, I would just be out stealing and killing people. That's the only reason I'm not doing it. (laughs) Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what controls my urge to do so, (laughs) is the law, right? So Um, bad, you know, bad people, quote unquote, or bad things are going to happen regardless of the law, as they have already been. So it's just another setup to get people rich, and it's another prohibition that keeps mm-hmm. a bunch of poor people down. So what's the joke of those, you know, if you ain't got the capital, you get the punishment. Right. It's true. It's absolutely true. You know, the the creek that, that one, runs through our property is a historic... <laughs> site where during the alcohol prohibition um that was the waterway where the moonshine was delivered down Mm. was 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 back creek and um i don't know i'm thinking they should use it again 
I think isn't now because when I was still living in West Virginia, and I actually I worked at a bar for a few years, as you know, the craft brewing thing was happening, and we had beer from West Virginia and Maryland and Virginia breweries. But there was this cap on alcohol. West Virginia still had a very low legal limit on how much alcohol a beer could have in it, and it was mm. you know the. You know, I forget it was it was a four point five or five. It was a pretty low level, so there were beers that you know that were across the street that you couldn't that we couldn't legally sell. They were in Maryland. Well, Maryland had a higher volume, you know, law. They've changed the law since I've left, and now now it's a higher you know alcohol volume. They let loose a little bit on craft brewing. Which again is another whole way of politicians give a bunch of lip service to small businesses, but when the rubber hits the road, they do everything they can to make it difficult, especially if you're dealing in beer or some sort of vice that's going to people get get uppity about. But I think there's now some legal moonshine distilling in West Virginia. The last time I was there, and we went to the liquor mm-hmm. store, it's there on a shelf with a fancy label. Yep. Yeah, it's a big thing in this area, actually. Um, when we first moved in the neighborhood, we live in a very rednecky area. <laughs> um, we were <laughs> we were welcomed to the neighborhood with an invite for um, slow cooked bear meat and moonshine. Woo! Uh, yeah, party time. <laughs> so we we thanked them, but you know we we didn't go. <laughs> yeah, I've, I did want to try the bear meat. Uh, yeah, but. I've never had bear meat (laughs) that's right i may be a west virginia boy but that's the thing so growing up parents were fairly baptist and religious um but we had a huge garden mom made some of our clothes like we actually did a lot of the things that now we're talking about going oh man i need a sewing machine or we need to start growing more food these things again that are you know and even in some cases our parents and grandparents all did and they had victory gardens so it's mm-hmm. funny, I was thinking about this as we were sort of getting ready for the show today because I was doing domestic kitchen work. Here's my funny flip with my, here's my sort of, Cassie and I, my longtime partner, she and I have been together for 15 years. We met in Shepherdstown going to college. Aww. Um, and are And are engaged and are probably going to get married pretty soon um, and just do it quickly. <laughs> Just get it done. And just get it done to me, everybody. Like, <laughs> you can't all come. We can't do it everywhere. It's over. <laughs> but the That's funny, we my, my funny, you know, our, our role reversals in some way. She's out working extra shifts out at her gig with like the public and there's gear and there's stuff. But actually, she's at a comic book convention right now in Portland. And I was back here doing some kitchen and doing some domestic work. <laughs> but I was thinking, <laughs> if. You know all the prop, all the World War II propaganda, and I mean it's propaganda. But you look at some of not the not the hateful stuff, but the stuff about your home and all the things to do in your home. Mm-hmm. If all of that stuff, and they're in some ways right, they needed it for the effort. Things weren't as massively industrialized as they are now. That's why it was sort of the post World War II boom. All those things you saved meant something. All the stuff you did at home meant something. And if mm-hmm. all of that stuff was actually powerful enough to win a war, either psychologically or physically, those are some of the tools now that you go, oh, canning, gardening, making our own food, not taking part in this stuff, removing your consent and your participation from every way possible. And that we're not necessarily out bullhorning and sort of playing that paradigm with cops who don't care about what you're bullhorning about and people who are just trying to commute back from some job that they're pissed off about having to do. You're going to make them mad. And tra- There was actually a big uh, protest broke out here in Portland yesterday about the Dakota Access Pipeline. And mm. it wasn't so much big as it was well-timed. It was, you know, Friday at 5 in the downtown area, so it was cluster F. Oh boy. Mm. But I was but I was but I was surprised that it that it broke out that quickly. So that's in relation to to yeah, what we were talking about yesterday with the latest moves of of is it or isn't it on or off. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think they are definitely trying to take steam out of the out of the movement um, because it's something that they don't understand. They haven't been able to turn them into thugs. It's uh, so not is, working. Is it seems like you know, assuming it all goes forward, they do some debates, blah blah blah. It's going to be close. Hillary's going to win. There'll probably be election chicanery in certain places, but again, it's already you know. It's already set and done. As it's going by, and now we know, we I mean, Think Progress, one of the kind of liberal blogs, I think blew it out of proportion to say, Alex Jones it is advising Donald Trump as though he's sort of on the payroll and is there and advising and meeting every day. <laughs> well, then you look at the story and it kind of says, well, they've met before and they've talked about some stuff. But he's hardly, you know, you know doing the daily briefing or anything. But that's still important because it's been ob- you know, obvious as this last year has gone by. What we're all looking at, at the news and whether it was Drudge or Fox or Bright, all of those places are now using Infowars news. And I've been saying a bunch that it's like mainstream culture ate conspiracy culture, and it's now being sort of regurgitated and sold back out. And all our shows and all our news and everything is actually conspiracy. It's one yeah. of the most popular, you know, growth sectors of the, of the entertainment world. Yeah. So is it, it is. possible and that so easily debunkable too? <laughs> I guess what I, all I'm kind of getting at is it possible that all of the sort of what the main line would consider conspiracy theorists that CIA made weaponized term that everybody runs with and uses. That all the conspiracy theorists and all the truthers and the birthers and the weirdos, they're all for Trump and that this will be the one kind of big and they'll all be wiped out in one fell swoop just by the win of Hillary will kind of be the all the sort of the win of of social justice warriors over the hateful that that is what sort of the, the game will be symbolized as. So again, mm. I, just as we're talking about, it's all, you know, the powers that shouldn't be get their cronies in spot because they're playing chess. Meanwhile, checkers for the dummies, they know that it sets the psychological tone. So whether it is Hillary or by some, I would think, crazy move, Trump. Or like I said, if he gets whacked, the psychological move of what the populace is going to do, what the masses of asses are going to do. And again, they say the real action is in the reaction. So the gangsters are going to keep doing their thing and running their game that we'll figure out later on as it sort of unveils itself. But the game for the dummies is going to be fighting over R&D. Right. Yeah, when they've, when they've backed both sides, so it really doesn't matter uh-huh. to, you know. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the other funny thing. It's a lot of wasted energy. And really, I mean, if you look at what day it is, it's, it's the 10th of September, right? Which we haven't today talked should, about. Yeah. Should be the, today should be the day you throw away your TV because you don't want to be involved in their little, um, you know, death cult, uh, reenactment tomorrow. You, you just don't want any type of involvement in it. Um, because it, it'll suck your soul dry. <laughs> well, and Throw I'm, it away! I'm, I'm bad. I'm glad you actually find it. Because even when we set up this interview weeks ago, it was sort of like, hey, let's, uh, oh, let's do 9-10. That'll be the day before 9-11. At least, you know, it'll have, we'll know there'll be, you know, heightened tensions. As it always sort of gets cranked up, and I talked about on my show yesterday, you know, the stupid mattress place with the offensive 9-11 commercial, the kids right. that dressed up as the towers at a Comic-Con, and the stand of, like, Coke at the Walmart. That's what passes for 9-11 news now, 15 mm-hmm. years later. And I'm, you know, in some, I'm guilty of it myself. That's what I'm talking about. I'm just going, is this what, this is where we are in 15 years? Because now we have huge swaths of people who barely know what it is, let alone have an emotional reaction to it or from it, let alone know all the things that changed from that right. moment on, and that it continues to be the blank check. So huge props to homie James Corbett. 
the videos he put out all this mm-hmm. week of the 9-11 yeah. suspects. He's always, he brings it right back to the thing we all forgot about and should have been discussing all along. The heist. The heist. I was kind yeah. of surprised one of them he had in there was Bob Bear. Mm. I'd be I'd be curious because it feels like that guy, you know, I instantly looked him up on Twitter because I was going to tag him and be like, yeah, what do you say to this, dude? <laughs> That because that's what's nice. interesting about all these people, you know, they've all you know, they've, they've all got Twitter accounts. They've all, for the most part, yeah. are accessible public figures in some way. It's weird. I don't know. It is. It's, it's, it is. So it's hard. At you know, as time goes on, it's like, oh, now you know what we are. Are we just the the nutters who were talking about JFK in the mm-hmm. mid to late seventies? <laughs> Yeah, like, dude, you guys yeah. are talking about JFK still. I mean, what about Nixon? What about Vietnam? What about the oil embargo? What about all this Iran stuff? Like, yeah, all that stuff is based on JFK. It's the fundamental event for everything that we're still doing, and to try and sort of, again scream at the rooftops about it. But at this point, you know, I mean, how often really? And again, that's why I think it's important. So good the work that that James does especially around the 911 anniversaries. Yeah, he's the man. Absolutely. Um and it, and it's like people don't want to mention it but at the same time they do because it's it's just right out there. And 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 so like you said these examples of you know this weird stuff that passes as 911 news, well, well meanwhile, you know, they've they have this big memorial that they brought all of the you know like ashes and remains or whatever back to why did they do that you know there's no news about the family going why are you doing that you don't bring remains back to the site of the trauma you know to to lay people to rest well that's the thing it's like they're doing (laughs) if you didn't know better you'd think they were pulling off weird occult rituals yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, if you didn't know better. If you were just guessing and bullshitting around, you know. <laughs> hey, you know, there is one other piece of 9-11 news I forgot about, and whether or not this will turn into a good thing or if it's limited hangout or who knows what, the House okays bill to let 9-11 families sue Saudi Arabia. So that was another that happened wow. late yesterday as well. So Fridays, you know, in in the media, that's what they call dumping day. So yeah. all kinds of things kind of fall out on Friday or over the weekend. Interesting. Mm-hmm. We won't attack your, we will attack uh, Baghdad instead, but, you know, 15 <laughs> years later, we'll let people sue you. Like, like money means anything to them. Uh-huh. Just, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Isn't that, I mean, but again, but they know it means something to us. Right. And especially, wow. I mean, and of course it would if you had your, family destroyed you would Mm -hmm. want some money that's what's tough that's what's tough about things that's why it's hard to get mad at people who aren't paying better attention because you know that they have like there's all these layers of of kind of work to go through you know and i realize you know i was listening to jello biafra and dead kennedys and punk rock and stuff in the late in the late 80s and early 90s so i realized i was kind of radicalized at a pretty early age Mm -hmm. but kind of realized i don't know that there was a better way to go about it and that was something that jello b offered talked about it's like don't act like punk rock is your little costume that you put on and you do this thing it's like it is like it is what you are and that's something i think i've tried to always kind of keep so that's for me i think why you know, being in alternative media is kind of what I've always done. And I've joked, and it's like the, the main, I didn't go to the mainstream. The mainstream kind of came to us, looks like we were saying earlier. I mean, mm-hmm. the all the work the alternative media did in the Audis is now what's being kind of spat back out. That's true. Absolutely. But As I guess I was just going to work. It's, it's, I guess I was just going to say it's more powerful to just sort of not take part in the system and work your way. And, you know, as Richard Grove says, learn your way forward than to sort of go, oh, well, I've got a I've got a you know, here's how I look and dress and do my hair. And so you'll know that I'm into this or that. 
I love just wearing a white t-shirt and blue jeans and knock off, you know, Chuck Taylors and just sort of being kind of nondescript. And for me, that's always been a much more subversive way of like, you had no idea I was going to do that stuff to you. (laughs) You going to stick around for a second? Yeah. Do you have other, you got other folks dropping in? Yeah. We're going to bring Mikey Blue Hair in here. Hey, I know that guy. Cool. Let me, yeah, let me stick around for just a little bit more. All right, a few, few minutes. Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. Welcome back to The Bridge with Kira. It's the second hour on the 10th of September, 2016. And my guest today is James Evan Pilato. Welcome back. Thanks so much. Thanks for letting me run my mouth so much. Yeah, it's fun. Um, I was going to say, I, I don't really have the um, the choice of being nondescript. Uh, <laughs> it's a good choice to have, but it's one that <laughs> has not been available to me in my, in my life. I'm six foot one and female, and I have gigantic boobs, so people notice me, <laughs> and <laughs> they can't help it. All right. So, but um, I would s- sometime like to um, try being nondescript. <laughs> well, and you know, and again, there's... The- we all have to recognize privileges that that we that we do have. I'm lucky. I'm a cute white guy, and that I realize has probably let me get away with some things. I've never really had much problem with the police, except mm. for that time I was arrested in Maryland. Mm, yeah, <laughs> I've never had much problem with them. I'm just like, hey, big boy, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I drive when we go to the powwow. So, um, speaking of powwows, let's um, let's see if uh, Mike Blue Hair is available to join us in our shit talk conversation here. He actually went to the um, to Cannibal. Yeah. He was there for I don't know two weeks, two or three weeks. You there, Mike? No. Yes. Maybe. Oh, it's still ringing. I think. I first met Mike. Okay. When he was doing some video stuff for Alex Ansari, who did a show called Outside the Box, who is still around, who still makes media. He's pretty much, I think, been kind of living off the grid and just uploads YouTube videos of here I am in my place in Colorado. I think he's slowly you know, becoming more and more self-sufficient and going through that battle. But Mike yeah. was also doing video stuff for Ground Zero, Clyde Lewis, who I would actually go on to work for in, in commercial radio years later. Wow. Are you there, Mike? Hmm. I don't hear him. T- turn. We don't hear you, Mike. It looks like you're on, but we don't hear you. Maybe he'll chime in there. Pop in. Well, hey. I, I reshared the other day a video where... We, on the ninth anniversary of 9-11 in 2010, Mohawk Mike and me and Clyde Lewis and Alex Ansari and a bunch of other people, we burnt the 9-11 commission report. This was the year that, was his name Terry Jones? The guy that was going to burn the Quran, and that was what passed for 9-11 news that year. Do you remember that? Yes. Yes. So we I did do. a publicity stunt where we sent out press releases to all the local news places and said, this is a publicity stunt because burning books is stupid, but we're going to burn the 9-11 commission report. So at least on this anniversary, we can talk about the events of 9-11 and not some new made-up controversy that has nothing to do with what we want found. So only one news station came out, and they actually covered our event, talked to us, and they included us on their, like, five-minute, you know, New, you know, nine eleven package of of news coverage that had the world news, that had you know the of course the events in D.C. and New York, 
But all of that, they actually aired on the 9-11 anniversary. I have it up on my YouTube channel, and the whole reason I got it was because Mike got it to me on VHS. <laughs> wow. I'm asking him right now which one he wants to be called on. Which one? Well, you're lucky. Okay. I'll just I no, keep that's... running my mouth while you do tech. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's good. It's a real good thing. Um, so he'll get back to me here. I, I tried both and both didn't work. Um, his phone or his Skypey. And I don't um, have a ton of time left, actually. But if I could, I would just give my quick uh, whore pitch. Can I flog my... Absolutely, my please, wares. Please, please, please. <laughs> I've got some snake oil and some some pills and no, guess what? <laughs> I don't have I don't have any of that stuff. It took ten years of doing Media Monarchy. So the very first post on the first website, MediaMonarchy.blogspot.com, was the original site. Went up on September eleventh, two thousand five, and in those previous wow. few years, I had gotten into. Go ahead. Hello. Sorry. I had gotten into 9-11 research and was just kind of doing it privately on my own. Hello. Hey. We do have Mike Blue hey. here. here. Hey. Um, hi, Kira. Uh, hi. Welcome to the party. <laughs> I have James Evan Pilato here, and he was telling us the story of the evolution of his media empire. <laughs> oh, nice. What's up, buddy? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of James's work. I've been watching it a long time. I'm in. I'm doing well. How are you? Doing good. It's good to it's good to hear you. It's fun to meet up in a random different place. I was telling Kira about I first met you a decade ago when you were doing video work here in Portland for Clyde and Alex, and that you actually got me the video of the Coin Six when they came out and covered our 9/11 protest. Oh yeah, I I, I do remember that. I haven't been on radio with you since we were on Clyde show. Uh, it was maybe seven or eight years ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, remember his anti-police st uh, state show that uh, you and Alex, uh, Andrew and I were on? Yep, yep, and that was even back now at, yeah. at, at the old studios, so they don't even do the show oh, there yeah. anymore. Yep. So, Been doing a lot of uh, personal and media evolving since then myself, uh, doing the cop watching and whatnot. And you were on the scene in North Dakota? Oh, yes, there was. I was out there for two weeks. Yeah, so the timeline of that, of those events are, are, are pretty interesting, I think, to me. Um, you know, so you have a, in April, the Sacred Stone camp gets established. And then round about, I guess, the beginning of August, they put out a call for moccasins on the ground. We need you. And this camp, the Sacred Stone camp, is like a prayer camp. That's... They they were really focused on we want to get this thing done more in a sphere. Even though they were camped out there, where they were digging, they wanted to get it mm -hmm. kind of done on a, on the spiritual uh, level there. Um, so they put out the call and and people started showing up first second week of August, and then the first direct action happened on the fifteenth of August, and that was spur of the moment. Um, where Umpa Numpa and his daughter Tashina Sapuwe, and there were other adults present that were like, "Hey, let's let's get these younger adults to jump over the fence. Women jump over the fence and and just push their way to the river and stop the construction." So that was the first time it was it was stopped, and we um, um, we interviewed her on the twentieth to Tashina, and she told her story about about that and so after they jumped over and they stopped the construction uh, Chase Iron Eyes of Last Real Indians was there saw that cut the fence and then led a bunch of um, people through that fence to go after who were inspired by the women and then that's where you got all the footage from Unicorn Riot of the people standing in front of the um, the bulldozers and what have you uh, so then um, then on, I think it was like the 30th or the 31st, it was that Wednesday where the world fell in love with Happy Dale, American Horse Jr., who, um, you know, attached himself to the digger. And um, Mike Bluehair got fantastic footage of that 
Um, but we also, you know, didn't realize that we were witnessing the Red Warrior um, group sort of take over the event with this planned direct action. Uh, so Red Warrior is basically a reinvention of Last Real Indians, which is a reinvention. And Last Real Indians is a reinvention of AIM. So they're all kind of in that same uh, oriented camp. And the established group there, Sacred Stone, really doesn't want these more um, in-your-face direct actions. They want to do things legally. They want to... Um, it looks like we lost Mike for a second. Hmm. They want to... Um, they want to... Uh, they, they want to do it the way they've been shown. So, um, you know, uh, with this latest decision, it's, it looks like uh, the, the tribe and the more established people that were already there are sort of pushing, let's not do this, um, let's not do this uh, direct action stuff anymore. Let's see where we go with the legal stuff and the prayer stuff. So that's sort of like the inside um, scoop on that. Let me mm. try to call him again. Um, well, that's a good... and that's what you're not going to see in the alternative media. You're not going to see it in the native media. You're, you're just going to get it from people who are on scene and who know what's going on. Mm. Well, um, and that's probably that. true for everything. So much even of what we do is we're all just reading and pulling other stories from other places. But right, to actually go right. and see. And I try to I try to get the scoop from people who are there rather than rehashing. But I mean there you have to rehash to a certain degree. Uh oh. You've reached Mike Blue here film the- <laughs> Please call hmm. back. Um hey, I was just gonna if I can finish your story. Yeah, let me yeah. let me wrap up my stuff and I'll and I'll I'll get out. But actually, are you... Um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's calling me on my phone. On your phone? Right. Phone. Yeah, here, I'll, I'll um, mute my mic, and then you go ahead and finish your... Um, I'll do my, my wrap-up. Yeah. All I was basically saying is it sort of took 10 years of doing Media Monarchy yeah. before it could reach the point where I felt like I could really kind of ask for the real money and support. So the long and short of it was I worked in a commercial radio station for three years, realized I'd kind of rather be doing it myself and that the amount of, that the window was perfect and that the blessing has been getting to hook up with someone like James Corbett who's exploded over the years. And so I get the gift of attention I probably wouldn't have had by myself by being able to do New World Next Week with James. So the gift of that extra, you know, that the 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 co-hosting, the the work that we do together, that attention let me say, well, now's probably the last best time I could really say, I want to make Media Monarchy my job. So I quit my radio station job summer 2015, sort of relaunched Media Monarchy 2.0, if you will, and did a lot of behind-the-scenes work with the websites and server space and kind of made it all legit-like. And as soon as it turned 2016, in January, I started doing a daily morning show, Monday through Friday, and I also do a daily DJ set. So I do an hour-long live news broadcast at 9 a.m. Pacific time, via my own website on mediamonarchy.com slash listen, and anybody can hit that up and listen. And actually, Jared, who runs Radio Confluence, who's one of the places that's simulcasting this right now, or were, and we thank him, he simulcasts all the Media Monarchy live stuff. So I do a news show and a music show Monday through Friday, and the amount of news and the amount of, of new media and exciting new things to discuss that have been able to sort of grow on my own morning show even over the course of now just eight, nine months, has been such an amazing growth and that I know I'm on the right path. And so being able to do that and kind of make that my job, I'm basically trying to do it Monday through Friday, nine to five, and I work on Media Monarchy as though I were, you know, trying to go to work somewhere else, except, you know, I... (laughs) 
that was the hardest part about being in a commercial station because one, it's super easy. I can run my mouth and talk about music till the cows come home. They love to let me do that for a small amount of money while I also was the producer and the board op and the co-host and doing, you know, five jobs. But everything I make there, it all goes to them. Yeah, I get a paycheck. But all sort of the glory and everything you create, like that station owns all that stuff. And you just kind of work there until they think, yeah, you sound old. You're fired. Yeah, but my contract, yeah, we'll buy it out. It's brutal. So I love being able to basically do it myself and feel sort of the joy of building myself with people I've known for a long time, people I've known digitally for a long time, and being able to just sort of do that. And so that's what I am pretty much doing, you know, day in, day out. You got two Media Monarchy broadcasts a day. So the morning news show and a music show. Because I've been a... DJ for a long time. I think the funny part is a lot of the people that do alternative media never made media before. And that's such a powerful thing. And that's what's so great about even the community at Radio Confluence. You have a bunch of people who never made radio shows before. They never did much of this stuff before, but are into news and are into music and into community. And they're all doing it and kind of trying it out for some of the first times or maybe getting back into doing it. And people are, again, the sort of building it themselves, building their own radio stations. That, to me, has been so exciting and so much fun. And that I, you know, it's fun to have people who only know me from, you know, New World Next Week to maybe listen to some of the shows and go, oh, you're like a, you're like a radio guy. You're like, you're like a DJ guy. Wow, you know a lot about music. It's sort of that extra layer, I think, that people can discover and I realize you know that's in some ways going to be a select audience of alternative media people who might be going like yeah I don't give a crap about your stupid music but there's a whole other swath of people who rather like the music and that's another way to sort of bring people in and go oh wow this new music is awesome and that's always been you know I've I've only ever wanted to share media with people it's pretty much what I've always done. Fortunately, the military invented this crazy thing, and I can share with all kinds of people what I've always been doing sort of on my own. I'm now, you know, I'm in a room with, you know, with, with my books and records and media, and I'm able to sort of, I don't know, it's just a natural place for me, and it just sort of feels right, and it's the kind of the right thing in the right place at the right time, and I'm lucky to be able to, to be doing it right now. I'm really happy for you. Um, I kind of feel like a little bit of echo here, but um, that's where I want to get to, where the food, growing my own food mm. and doing radio is my thing, and I don't have to, you know, do the secretarial drag thing to <laughs> to pay the other bills. Um, I would love to do that. So, And I never knew that I would do radio, ever. It was just one one day I discovered um, that the, my doctors had been messing with me and telling me I had fibromyalgia when I really had celiac disease my whole life. And uh, I said, you know what? This has probably happened to a lot of other people. <laughs> Might want to share for my the things I've learned about this. Um, and so, uh, yeah. And then also I'm a, I'm a psychopath magnet. So, um, and a narcissist I, magnet. So I figured, well, I've learned some strategies on how to, you know, um, deal with that and, 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 and get the cluster B's cleared away. Um, so I could share that. And then I'm just basically, you know, uh, somebody who has a high IQ and no, know, nowhere to, to, to use it. Because they won't let me use it at work, that's for sure. Because you can't have a high IQ and big boobs. Those those don't go together. What do you mean? It is. Um, it's, so. it's a weird, it is a little odd. Because, of course, I had, you know, initially a couple of people were like, hey, watch, you know, when I when I first just sort of left the radio job in the summer of 2015, and I pretty much spent, you know, July and August, the rest of that summer, having a good time in the summer. And had, you know, somebody be like, now careful, if you, you, know, you don't work too long, you'll never want to go to work again. I knew that wasn't going to be the case because I knew what I was going to be working on. It just wasn't something I was 
going to be able to sort of explain to him. You know, it's funny. The easiest thing is anymore, I should just be like, I run a home radio station. Like, that's, I should just stop thinking like, well, I did, you know, this media, and, and it was after 9-11, and blah, blah, blah. I should be like, I just, I run a radio station myself. It's just going to be the simplest way to do it. And that's in some ways where, you know, I kind of talked about this old sort of Hillary, the Hillary movement will be able to kill all conspiracies in one fell swoop. It's sort of like any of those people who believed in any of that junk, you guys all just got beat. And now you're done and will no longer even act like we're going to tolerate any of your stupid ideas. Yeah, I guess it's. Yeah, I don't think that'll work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it'll be a push. The veil, the veil's lifting. It'll in, be another regardless of what they do. Kind of push in the in the. It'll be the push and the pushback in the culture war. I guess what I'm yeah. trying to say. I think the more we create our own things, whether that's gardens or radio stations or zines or bands or mo- any of that stuff in our, you know, local community or sort of our digital community. The more we create our own thing, the less we're tied and tethered to these things that are going to kind of come and go. That's what's been really frustrating, seeing people I've sort of, you know, known in the alternative media for a long time hop on the Trump train. And I've never, you know, had the time to ask all these kind of different people to be like, are, do you, are you really into this? Because if you would say, oh, I'm into it just for the complete train wreck of it all because I think it'll wreck the entire system. It's like, oh, okay, well, that's at least... <laughs> that, I, can, I can get down with that, at least and now I know why you're doing it because you think it'll be the thing to wreck everything. But to have people who I know in the alternative media, it's like all they want... You know what he's really pushing is more military, like more homeland security, more wall it's all the things i thought lots of people in the alternative media didn't want and that's when you realize oh there's a box inside the box inside the box to get out of Mm -hmm. and there's lots of co-opted scenes and memes and that's why yeah i realized early on even before 9 11 or any of this stuff was like i'm never gonna be in any groups (laughs) i'm never gonna call myself a blank ist mm-hmm. or I'm a card carrying member of this or that it's like that's just bad scene so that's what comes from you know growing up in a small town where all you see is sort of football and religion like I'm yeah. gonna not join any of those clubs <laughs> they're not for me I don't fit into those clubs at all yeah yeah scary stuff and even even the the gun club that is my neighborhood um, nonstop, you know, target practice day and night. Ah. Um, I could probably beat them all at target practice, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't sit out there every day and shoot a gun all day long. You know, like I have better things to do with my time and, you know, like watching TV. It's amazing what that does when you get rid of that, uh-huh. that whole suck in your life, the time suck the energy suck, the thinking of things that mm-hmm. go on in it suck. Um, it's amazing how much time it frees up. I think more and, and more that's why I continually bring more music into what I do because it's what I have always had always done. So I ran, and actually you should, if you ever get a chance, roll over to Shepherdstown, West Virginia. That's the college town. I lived for 10 years. I ran the the radio station there. Eighty nine point seven W S H C. Some of the most uh-huh. difficult. Some of the most difficult call letters to spit out. S H C for <laughs> for for Shepherd College. It was it used to be Shepherd College. It's actually a university now, but it's a cool little college town. You could go have a great meal and and check out some really historic. It's one of the, it's the oldest town in West Virginia. But that was we where I was a, a a DJ at the radio station. Starting in 95, by the year 2000, I was running the the programming, picking the heavy rotation, doing the, you know, all the stuff. So did all of that, and that was a lot of my radio training. And then when I moved out to Portland, I realized I wasn't going to be able to get a job lickety-split at a different radio station. 
And luckily, the way it turned out, I actually got a job at what was a cool, you know, kind of local grocery store chain. And then I got to see sort of the food revolution happen with, mm-hmm. you know, the, the sort of, you know, organics 2.0 and all of the changes in the, as the economy crashed. So I worked at this grocery store from 2006 to 2012, all the while doing, it was, it was basically grocery boy by day, media monarchy by night. And that was, those were the years where I sort of built up what media monarchy was. And again, this was the waning years of the Bush years into Obama and then doing, you know, New World Next Week, all the while I was working at this grocery store. So it was great to learn what, I, you know, it's sort of, you didn't realize it so much at the moment and later you go, oh, I saw all those changes happen and I saw all those companies getting gobbled up and I saw the move of organics and non-GMO and all that stuff kind of coming to a head on the grocery store shelf. I mean, that is, in a lot of ways, that is a sort of ground zero of, you know, American life and economy, and you can judge a lot of what is going down by what's happening in that kind of grocery store space. That's For, where food world order comes from, is your your grocery boy by day. That's exactly right. That's where, yeah, that's where I coined that, that phrase food world order, and that became, you know, an area in the media monarchy kingdom, as I call it, of, <laughs> of, of interest. Because, you know, there's always so many different things. This is like when I used to play in bands. It was always, it was like, I don't want to be in one band. I want to be in like six bands because I don't want to just play this one style of music. I have all these other interests. So that was sort of the way to create these different areas within media monarchy. And now as the technology has changed, we, I mean, we first really utilized it well starting a few years back with New World Next Week. So the show that I do with, with James Corbett, and we've been doing it since 2009, it's funny the things that end up being your signature thing. It's the stuff you never sort of plan or, or sort of intend. You know, the things we sweat and work and whether that's art or creating, all that stuff, you blood, sweat, and tears, and you go, look, everybody, and they go, meh. But the thing you sort of just did naturally that you couldn't even recount how it came together, that's the thing that people are going to be blown away about. So maybe mm-hmm. it does have that authenticity and that and that organic, if you will, feel to it. Well, I find that um, the stuff that I'm most proud of, you know, you, you get the least amount of hits on it. But the stuff that you're like, ah, it's <laughs> just like everybody just loves it. They're like, woo. Yeah, that's what's so that's in some, you know, that's always the I think that's probably what keeps lots of people working forward in all the things they do, because you're trying to find you're trying to find the middle ground of those things. How can I do the, my art that I like to do that then everybody's happy and you know, it works well for both, for both sides? I think that's, yeah, mm-hmm. that's the constant kind of battle looking forward. But I think all I was, I was kind of saying is, you know, I had a long background in radio and then I went to, so if you've ever heard of Ground Zero with Clyde Lewis, He's a radio host. He's originally from Utah. That's where he started doing Ground Zero. He just started doing it. It's funny. We Ground Zero started in 95. That's also when I started to do college radio. Clyde is a few years older than me, but we have a funny, like kind of similar path and some some similar interests in, you know, punk rock and negative land and old sci-fi movies and all that kind of stuff. But he was a radio host here in Portland And his show got picked up nationally because, as I told you, conspiracy stuff is popular. If it's packageable enough, they'll totally put it on TV or on the radio because they know people are interested. They know the Internet kicked their ass. So that's why mainstream TV and radio have to be like the Internet now. That's all you look at is stuff is they're getting it off the Internet I hate having to look at, you know, try to look at what's going on in my own city and they're carrying, you know, stupid news stories that don't affect my life. I'll look at it and you'll see some horrible story and go, oh, that's awful. Oh, wait, that's in Florida. You're just carrying it because it's clickable media and you don't really care. It's like they want to be the Internet. So I worked at 
commercial radio station for three years. I worked with Clyde for about a year and a half, and then for the other year and a half, I was the co-host on this morning show on a rock station. And again, realized as I started to basically pull away, because I realized pretty much my reputation was going to be ruined, because it wouldn't be long before it would be, you know, is that the media monarchy guy shilling... You know, stupid products, and because that's the, <laughs> that's the dumb stuff you have to do when you get like when you're on a commercial morning. Like I've, I, you know, I still look back at the station and see it's like, oh my god, he's at the car dealership doing the thing. <laughs> like I hate all of that stuff. I don't drive. I never owned a car. I don't want to have anything to do with any of that crap. So it was very easy for me to kind of go, oh. I actually have the upper hand here. The internet ate your lunch, and now you're lucky you've got an authentic person who not only knows all the media, but knows how to push all the buttons and can run his mouth while doing it all. They were going to be more than happy to let me almost be hip. Yeah, do your hipster curmudgeon thing. Be mad about stuff. They were going to be more than happy to let me be me because they realize they can't invent and they can't consult they can't create and cast an authentic person I'm good at doing it because it's what I've always done I was a little kid in my room playing records so I don't have to fake it and I you know I could always of course could always be better at all the things but I realized they needed me more than I needed them the only parts they win on is that they are the bigger structure. They get the concert tickets and they get the publicists that call to set up, you know, the actors and the stuff who have things to promote, whether that's books or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I basically worked there, figured out I could do it on my own, left and kind of took some of the contacts and I'm just going to build it myself because <laughs> I sort of like there's no trick to it now it's like oh I know how this all works I know who you have to call to get an interview with that cool author mm-hmm. so it's sort of you know I figured out how the mainstream does their thing you still call some of the same people but you can have way better content so I guess that's to, all of this is to basically say I've hopefully kind of made and now positioned Media Monarchy that I'm not so devoted to Movement A or Candidate B so that when that inevitably fails or fades, I go with it. I've hopefully right. made a thing to where, no, those trends and those things are going to move and we'll talk about them, but we're sort of authentic enough and we've put it all on the table now for 10 years that you know I haven't changed and you know that I've never lied to you about this or that. So that it can kind of weather those storms. I mean, look, comedians, they really took to podcasting first. They're some of the most culturally important people. I would argue that the podcasters... You know, whether that's you know Mark Marin or or any of them, the you know the 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 excellent you know the pros because they're comedian. That's what they do. They are the new sort of Nirvana. They are the cultural change that kind of happened, and in some ways we're all part of that in all our little different ancillary, organic, connected ways. So isn't that, I think, kind of the most the most powerful thing is realizing sort of that decentralized bit. Hell, maybe an EMP is going to hit and we're not going to be able to all communicate all over the world mm-hmm. for a while. But I kind of see well, a more, I almost see a more community slash kind of nomadic future for America anyway. And that yeah. you'll have a radio station, but it'll just be in your town. It'll be your low power FM station. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, the government is definitely planning for the grid to go down. 
um, so that people should make uh, some plans regarding that if you can, if you can afford to. Um, and myself, I live on the other side of the digital divide. So my um, show is a road show. I'm doing this in a parking lot <laughs> because I can't do it at my house because the price I pay for living in the woods is that I don't get internet that I can actually use. Mm. So my only, and I'm putting these little air quotes around it, choice <laughs> for internet in the woods, um, because when the government and their corporations get together and decide who's going to be over the barrel when it comes to internet, uh -huh. it's always rural America every uh -huh. single time. Uh -huh. And um, because we, we can't defend ourselves, there's not enough of us. Um, and, you know, it's also, I think it's also part of... Um, you know, agenda 21. So the price, you know, they want people to keep moving into the towns and the cities into and into the cities. So they're e easily controlled. So you, you can't get internet out there in the woods where you're growing your own food and, you know, creating a sanctuary for birds and animals. Uh, you, you can't get internet out there. It's like, okay, well, I will use my iPhone hotspot and I'll do it in a parking lot <laughs> where I can get a signal because I'm going to keep doing it. Because obviously my voice is not supposed to be heard in this whole you know, conversation. Uh, <laughs> so that's why I'm going to be loud about it. <laughs> and because uh, <laughs> I'm not supposed to be heard. Well, and that's, um, you know, I've always kind of treated the internet in, in some ways like it could go away tomorrow. So I, you know, yes. much in like how some of us may have acted when all kinds of file sharing and movies and music and all kinds of stuff was suddenly available. You grabbed a bunch of it because you knew it wasn't going to be there forever. Now, in my defense, in the Napster heyday, I was into getting, like, bootlegs and things that weren't actually commercially available. So I was never like, I'm not really robbing from Bell and Sebastian. This is a bootleg they've never released anyway. I've already bought all their other albums. That's always, you know, for me as a, as a hardcore music fan, again, this sort of questions that pop up from time to time it's like oh i'm you know in some ways immune to that that's been a lot of sort of hey i just make my own radio station because you get lots of questions from people like oh you're allowed to do that can you play that song it's like yep sure can because <laughs> i just did <laughs> and i've done <laughs> nothing but ever you know promote bands and link to their work and support them and I go see them when they come to town. It's sort of, like, okay, That's the way to do it. I might not give money to BMI and ASCAP, but <laughs> I've given more promotion. You know, it's just sort of, it's like, well, it's part of what I do in my work. And that's And they another... don't even have to send you stuff, but they probably do. No, yeah, yeah it's it's both. Yeah. And again, that's, you know, that's a lot of what's, you know, people ask about music and information and all that stuff. It's like people want their information to get out. They want, they hope you'll talk about their little bit of information, whether it's an article or a song. And if they don't, there's something wrong there. There's something <laughs> weird. Why, why are you sharing it if you don't want it to be shared? Like, I don't know. Don't understand that. I guess, you know, getting philosophical about media monarchy but it is sort of for better or worse it is me in a lot of ways it is the sort of culmination and creation of all the things I've been interested in and wanted to do anyway whether that was news or music or art religion any of the different things and that sort of creating that again is Maybe that's also like comedians said. And I was class clown in school. Um, vo voted class clown, class of 95. <laughs> I was the class nonconformist. <laughs> we did not have that designation. <laughs> but you know how comedians say, you know, well, it was, a, it was in some way like a, a, a shell. You're able to use that as sort of your armor for the world. And I realized early on that it was like, oh, media is kind of my armor against the world in some way. And that as the years went by, I realized not only 
can it sort of be that? And that can be detrimental, to be sure. But to be involved in the creation of it. Just like I said, well, hell, maybe it'll get to the point where we all have to have our own little guardian drones. I realized, oh, if I have my own media armor, that's how I can sort of do whatever I want. And again, to go back to music analogies, there's a book called Our Band Could Be Your Life. And it's sort of all about the, you know, punk rock slash alternative scene of the 70s, 80s, 90s that turned into something where, you know, and that's what the punk kind of reaction of Led Zeppelin and Elvis and all that stuff was in the first place. It's like it doesn't have to be this huge monolithic corporate funded thing. You can do it yourself. Exactly. So that has that's, always been a huge inspiration for me was from that music scene to be able to do the same thing now with alternative media and that I was able to sort of make my own band, as it were, and call it Media Monarchy and that I was able to make that my job. And it's the DIY, you know, spirit of punk rock um, mm-hmm. that, that comes through. Um, speaking of DIY spirit of punk rock, Mike Blue Hair, are you back? Yeah, just uh, tune back in. Hey, buddy. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we uh, we were we were running our mouths here, and um, we lost you there. Uh, but man down. Yep. Man, but we got you back. Uh, well, and that should <laughs> and, and I should stop running my mouth. I should probably <laughs> hop off here. I appreciate you actually having me on for for as long as you did. We love having you. Um, thank you so much for for coming on. And um, please, I please come back sometime soon. Absolutely, yeah. We'll we'll continue. That's what's so great about any time you sort of make a new connection. You know, you kind of add that. And we might not yep. talk for a day or a week or a month or whatever. And you go, oh wait, but that's still a connection. Like we've still sort of built that and built that out, and you kind of know it's there. So uh, again, that's that's I love that, and that's always I think so valuable. So I'll I'll just I'll leave by saying thank you so much and and just ask people to come check me out at mediamonarchy.com. Good stuff. I'll see you Monday. Peace. Thanks so much. In the chat. Bye. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.